Shed engineering, but not as you know it. Making the beam and starting the parallel motion. Hello there, Alan Plum here with a little more from Shed Engineering, where we're exploring the possibilities of building a working model just using the average tools in an average shed without expensive lathes or milling machines and you can see the model beam engine um, in operation there now the rest of it might not be of huge interest to everybody uh, I'm going to explain a little bit more about the construction but it's mainly in photos so let's get down to uh, 18 RPM or possibly 15 RPM now hopefully you've seen the video where I go through the construction of the flywheel and bearings now the roller bearings were fiddly but by no means technically difficult uh, they just slid onto the shaft and I created a recess by just digging down with a, a chisel and dremel and created the recess for the bearings to fit into all that you have to do is make sure that the bearings are sitting the same height from the baseboard to make sure that they're absolutely level now I'm not working to any plans I'm very much designing this uh, as I go along now I've done some rough sketches obviously and measurements because obviously the height of the beam needs to accommodate the height of the cylinder plus the parallel motion uh, I need to know the length of the beam so that that would determine where the cylinder is going to be, be positioned and where the flywheel is going to be positioned so you've got a basic centre line running down the length of the beam a centre line where the columns are going to be another centre line for where the crankshaft will be and another centre line where the cylinder will be that cylinder by the way is just a, a mock-up that I was doing an experiment with so at this stage I've got those centre lines marked out on the baseboard and you can see a pencil line under the bearing now you're never going to be able to position something exactly so always bear in mind if you can allow some form of adjustment then it'll make it far far easier so in this case the hole in the baseboard is a lot larger than the hole in the bearing so I can move the bearing side to side and with that little bit of adjustment even though it's only uh, a few millimeters that would allow you to uh, move the bearing backwards and forwards and actually line it up next were the columns they were just pieces of 2x2 timber and again allowed some adjustment so the hole in the baseboard was a little bit bigger so that I could move them backwards and forwards and get them precisely lined up although they were an absolute pig to get absolutely vertical that took me a long long time it's around that time I decided my humble shed was a bit small even though I'd extended it down at the bottom and here you can see how I was extending it out another couple of foot at the front but that's another story altogether on the table there are my so-called plans just rough drawings showing the rough dimensions and layout of the size of the crank cylinder beam etc and I've started to make some cardboard cladding for around the columns but I wasn't actually happy with them they were slightly oversized so they've been abandoned then we had to mark out the beam now this is very very critical the measurements have to be as accurate as possible so what did I use? 
A micrometer? No, a piece of paper. It's going to be 12 and a half inches long from the most outer pivots to the central pivot. And finding the halfway point of 12 and a half is very, very complicated. You fold the paper in half. Folding the paper in half gives us six and a quarter. But we need to subdivide that again to get the position of the other pivots. So we fold the paper. With technology like this I think we ought to be called Flintstone engineering, let alone anything else. As crude as it may look, you have a clean, crisp pencil line to work to. And surprisingly, 3.125 happens to be 3 and 1 8 inches. Remarkably accurate. One side of the beam was cut out using just a small jigsaw and the holes for the pivots were drilled very carefully and that was then used as a template to mark out the other one. Now we have to make this horrible piece of MDF look like a cast iron beam. This was quite difficult. If you notice the insert in the center of the router there you'll see two or three little holes. In one of them there's a drill which is going down through the pivot. That is acting like a compass and so the router can be moved around in a circle and it will pivot on that drill. Uh, I actually wanted these little bosses sticking out so that it actually looked like uh, a cast iron beam but I made several several mistakes and I promise it wasn't easy. So that defined where the bosses were going to be and I run it obviously round the edge uh, to define where that was going to be. Now I could have routed it out in between but the amount of mess that it makes it just wasn't worth it and obviously being used to wood carving I much preferred to just take the center ground down using a chisel. And after many hours of scraping and sanding we got something that resembled a cast iron beam with the outer rim and the bosses uh, for reinforcement where the pivots were going to go. Then we had the task of sealing and painting another two coats of glass fibre resin followed by emulsion paint for the lighter green and gloss paint for the darker green. Terrible job, again the glass fibre resin made every fibre stand on end making it terribly difficult to sand down. Here you see the spacers for the centre of the beam uh, plastic washers, they were done with a speed bit and just shaped down. The central tube is a tube from the centre of a receipt roll again all cut to the same length and they acted as spacers in between the beam. I then drilled out between the beam and put bolts through and obviously once they were tightened up that kept it nice and firm. The central spacer uh, is inch and a quarter waste pipe and another plastic washer round the outside. And from Hobbycraft I found some half round little dots that look like washers and they've been stuck on the blue washers to uh, give the impression of rivets. Then we started on the central bearings for the beam again made out of MDF uh, pieces of cardboard cut out and stuck on to give the impression of some kind of casting and there you can see the small brass bushes that I purchased online which are just a push fit into the MDF to act as bearings. The two bases there in white are just building plastic. Uh, I've used a router to shape them down a little bit whether they will be permanent I'm not quite sure. 
Remember what I said about making things adjustable wherever possible? The same applies here. Think about it. The beam is going to be 27.5 inches long, pivoting between these bearings. If you move the bearing two or three thousandths of an inch, the end of the beam is going to be moving the best part of a millimetre or more. So here you can see my attempt at making them adjustable so that we can get the end of the beam and the piston rod directly over the cylinder. Another view showing the inside of the bearing where I've drilled it out. We don't want a tiny little spindle uh, eighth of an inch in diameter so that's been drilled out and here you see why. Two pieces of plastic tube from the inside of a till roll, washers glued on either end and covered in self-adhesive aluminium foil now giving the impression that the axle for the beam is a much larger diameter and there you see it in the bearings with the beam so now we have to make a start on James Watt's parallel motion James Watt invented a system of linkages which you can see hanging from the end of the beam there which actually kept the piston rod travelling vertically up and down by a system of linkages and radius arms. If you note to the bottom left you have the piston rod coming up to the crosshead that is connected to the two drop links where there's bearings halfway up you have the cotter pins and then the final connection up onto the beam. Here you have a picture of a James Watt beam engine. The crosshead is at the bottom there with the big nut and then the drop links leading up towards the beam with the two cotter pins in the middle. And a side view of one of those links you can see the bearing at the bottom, the cotter pin adjustment halfway up. And that's what we're trying to recreate. Right, I've determined the length of the link that I want. I've drilled two holes into a piece of MDF and put two of the same size drills in. And that effectively gives me a jig with a piece of aluminium angle stood up at the back. But how on earth do you manage to get a measurement for the strip of aluminium? Well, um, if you was Flintstone engineering, you might use a piece of paper. And that's exactly how I did it. I wrapped a piece of paper round, and that gave me a very accurate measurement. Cut your piece of aluminium to length, rub it with household soap, and then get your blowtorch and heat it up until the soap goes black and then leave it to cool. That is called annealing. Now the piece of aluminium is a lot lot softer. So it's a simple job now to just work the aluminium round the drill with a block of wood and that soon creates the outer strap for the drop link. We obviously need four of these and having a little jig like this gets them all exactly the same. Then we need something to fill in the centres and so building plastic is easy to work and we soon have that cut down and sanded to shape. Then we needed something to represent the brass bearings and I found some 13mm brass strip at my model shop hence the reason why I use 13mm drills to make the straps. I drilled them all out together in a little jig that I made that kept them all exactly the same and then I was able to file them down to roughly the right size and so we're well on the way to getting the parallel motion completed. But that's another 15 minutes disappeared hope you found it interesting Join me on the next one to see how it continues. Thank you very much for watching.